This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom with our ongoing conver nuclear free future conversation. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and please, viewers, welcome with me Kevin Camps, who is the nuclear waste watchdog for Beyond Nuclear. Kevin Camps, welcome to Channel 17. Thanks very much for having me, Margaret. And uh, it, I'm so delighted because uh, you are an expert on this this. Uh, question and problem of nuclear waste and uh, I like your your title nuclear waste watchdog <laughs> not not n nuclear waste manager or uh, anything else like that but watchdog and so Kevin could you start us off with telling us what is going on out in in uh, in Carlsbad and what what is that it's a nuclear waste depository repository and there was a leak right could you bring us up to sure. speed on that yeah, yeah. The waste isolation pilot plant is a repository, as you said, a geologic repository, the first in the United States, one of the first in the world. And the contents that are being sent there are plutonium contaminated military wastes from the U.S. nuclear weapons complex. It's been operating since March of 1999, and there have been many hundreds, even thousands of shipments of plutonium contaminated wastes to Carlsbad, New Mexico area. And it's been buried in this salt formation for these 15 years. And if you listen to the Department of Energy, if you listen to the contractors, the proponents in the area, everything had gone fine. That's not true at all, actually. And this kind of a leak was entirely impossible, they said. Not for 15 years, but for thousands of years into the future. Remember that plutonium is hazardous for 240,000 years, or 480,000 years, if you want to be safe about it. So here we are 15 years into this thing, and they had a uh, underground vehicle fire uh, about a month ago now that they say is unrelated to the radioactive release. And then just, uh, just over a week later, they had a radioactive release. 13 workers have been documented to have uh, contamination uh, internally, which is really bad because plutonium and other transuranics can do tremendous damage in the human body once ingested or inhaled, things like lung cancer, for example. So plutonium and americium have been detected up to uh, a half mile downwind of the site, and so it's becoming uh, a concern for local residents as well. This is, uh, this is shocking. I, I mean, because the, uh, the headline that I saw just today, Kevin, in, in the BBC News was the, uh, the radiation leak site that, that wants more nuclear waste. They want more nuclear waste there. How can this be? Well, there's a great book from the 1980s. It's called Forevermore by Barlett and Steele. It's a classic book about radioactive waste in the United States. And a lot of water has passed under the bridge since 1987. But there's a really great chapter in that book about the literally the used car salesman who then became mayor of that area out there who saw a great business opportunity. And it's been that way ever since. There's quite a booster club out there at WIP. The Department of Energy has poured lots of money into that community. So unfortunately, there are these so-called nuclear oases, places that really make their bread and butter on radioactive waste, for example. And it's not just the military plutonium wastes that they're looking to get more of out there. They're actually uh, applying as best they can to become the high-level radioactive waste parking lot dump for the country, and they wouldn't mind too badly if they buried it out there. Even though the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, starting about five, six years ago now, said that irradiated nuclear fuel cannot be buried in salt formations because it will fracture or deform the salt formation and could cause collapse of the tunnels and the burial chambers, but they're, they're still at it. Um, just after this incident unfolded at WIP a month ago now, the New York, the New York Times, uh, Matt Wald, had very interesting timing. He ran an article talking about this idea of burying high-level radioactive commercial wastes at WIP, and he mentioned that there had been this underground vehicle fire but the uh, radioactive release hadn't happened yet. And you would hope that, you know, the radioactive release would put an end to this talk of burying high-level waste at WIP, but the Booster Club uh, proceeds anyway. Yeah, and with the Booster Club, who is in the Booster Club? 
Well, it's often, and at WIP, it's true as well, it's a mix of local elected officials, higher level county elected officials, state elected officials, federal elected officials, and then the business community that's directly making money. So it's the businesses, the companies that um, make money on radioactive waste, and then uh, with their pocket change to politicians in terms of campaign contributions, and also have their army of lobbyists crawling over, you know, county government, over state government, over the federal government. So that's that's the booster club. We see it at a lot of the Department of Energy sites, Savannah River site, South Carolina. Kind of its claim to infamy is it's another one of these, we want to be the parking lot dump for high-level radioactive waste from the commercial industry kind of places. But if it goes there, there's a real risk that reprocessing would be the ultimate objective of getting all the waste in one place. So uh, different different takes on the issue and different specialty sets, skill sets, I guess you could say, and all very dangerous. Uh, any one of these parking lot dumps, if it were to go forward, would initiate the launch of unprecedented numbers of high-level radioactive waste shipments by road, by rail, by waterway through most states in the country. And this stuff is dangerous enough at the reactor sites going zero miles per hour, but you get it on the roads and rails going 60 miles per hour faster, uh, you're asking for all kinds of trouble. And Kevin, this is what you, you have called Mobile Chernobyl or the Fukushima Freeway, right? Yeah, uh, NEARS often comes up with a lot of these uh, kind of slogans, uh, Mobile Chernobyl, uh, floating Fukushima's, if you're talking about the barge shipments on the Great Lakes or the sea coasts or certain rivers. Uh, another one is dirty bombs on wheels, because these shipments would go through major metropolitan areas, other very vulnerable places, and they're not even designed to withstand terrorist attacks. So if you think about it, uh, tow anti-tank missiles are designed to penetrate 15 inches of steel, tank armor. These uh, shipping containers, the thickness on them is often simply structural and then some radiation shielding so that people near these shipments don't get fatal doses of gamma radiation. But it's not designed to withstand terrorist attacks. So there are countless tow anti-tank missiles free on the black market internationally. If one of those were used to attack one of these shipments as it rolled through, let's say, downtown Chicago, it would be an unprecedented radiological disaster. Kevin, I, I want to tell our audience that NEARS is Nuclear Information Research Service, right? Resource Service, yes. I used to work there before coming to be on oh, Nuclear. Resource Service, okay. And Kevin, are there, are there shipments now of nuclear waste uh, going across our country, USA? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, of course, we had just talked about WIP, and so, yeah, there were, there were, there aren't right now because it's all on hold, it's all suspended. There were regular shipments to WIP, and I had mentioned previous problems at WIP, and what was on my mind was they had a couple of transportation incidents uh, at WIP. One involved an internally contaminated container for shipping the plutonium wastes, and WIP was so concerned about contaminating their surface facilities because they had this claim of we're, we're squeaky clean out here, that they actually sent the thing all the way back to Idaho. So they doubled the transportation risks over a thousand miles each way to do that. Now they've got surface contamination. So those are regular shipments. There's other forms of regular nuclear materials and radioactive waste shipments. But the one thing that really doesn't move very much at all, if ever these days, is high level radioactive waste. So it's really a trickle some years, many years, there will not be a single shipment of high-level radioactive waste in the United States. Other years, there may be a handful. So some examples of that would be atoms for peace, highly enriched uranium irradiated fuel coming back from overseas where we ship this stuff to 41 countries. So Germany shipped some back in like the year 2001. Britain shipped some back the year before. Just a handful of shipments. And wouldn't you know, uh, the Department of Energy managed to screw up those German shipments, for example, in 2001. They had a series of mishaps during that transport. But we don't see very much of high-level radioactive waste moving around. But under you know the current proposals, there's a bill in the Senate called uh, the Nuclear Waste Administration Act. You would see thousands per year. Uh, if they use truck shipments, you'd see a lot more in numbers. If they use train shipments, it's a much bigger container on the trains. You'd see less in terms of shipment numbers, 
but every single one of those shipments is now a much greater quantity of high-level radioactive waste. Okay, two questions, Kevin. One is where where did that high-level radioactive waste go in 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 the early 2000s? And the two, the second question is is there legislature is there legislation on the table now for a mobile Chernobyl or? Okay, well the German shipments that came across the ocean by boat from Germany uh, came into South Carolina, into Charleston, were offloaded from the boat onto trucks actually that time. So I think it was a convoy of three semi-trucks with these dumbbell shaped but 20 foot long uh, high level radioactive waste containers. And then they, they traveled cross country to Idaho. And the place where they really ran into problems was Missouri. And they had a, a governor in Missouri who was very concerned at the time DOE managed to violate every agreement they had made with that governor. They showed up at the St. Louis city limits at rush hour. That was not supposed to happen. They passed by the Kansas City Royals baseball stadium during a home game. That was not supposed to happen. They had not designated emergency pull-offs uh, in case of bad weather, for example. And sure enough, they hit a severe thunderstorm and rainstorm, had no designated pull-off place. And so they simply pulled off on the side of the road. I think it was into a gas station with these three containers of high-level radioactive waste on board, now sitting in the open, sitting still, very vulnerable to attackers, for one thing. Um, in terms of the legislation, yes, indeed, uh, Senate Bill 1240, we have been resisting for well over a year at this point. It came out of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the U.S. Senate, and it's uh, Mobile Chernobyl, which we've been fighting for 25 years in its current incarnation. They claim that it is enacting the uh, final report of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future. That final report came out in January of 2012. This was President Obama's and the previous Energy Secretary, Stephen Chu's, attempt to come up with a Plan B now that Yucca Mountain has been wisely canceled by the Obama administration, you know, and tremendous thanks to them for that wise decision. Mm -hmm. But this bill, its top priority I refer to it as parking lot dumps. Uh, they refer to it as consolidated interim storage or centralized interim storage. And the top targets for moving the waste from the nuclear power plant sites would include Department of Energy facilities. We've mentioned WIP and Savannah River site. Another top target, which is very shameful, is Native American reservations. And I pretty much begged and pleaded with the Blue Ribbon Commission to not target Native American reservations yet again. Uh, for the umpteenth time, it's a very bad habit of the nuclear establishment in this country. It's radioactive racism. It's environmental injustice. Mm -hmm. and, and sure and enough, they're, they're doing it again. And the final category of target would be uh, nuclear power plant sites themselves. So one of the top ones would be Dresden, Illinois, three reactors, plus the GE Morris high-level radioactive waste storage pool, which was going to be a reprocessing center but thank goodness never operated because of a major uh, design flaw. They have 3,000 tons of high-level radioactive waste at that one site already. So it's got to be a top target for bringing yet more. Well, when you mention the Native American land, uh, the Yucca Mountain is actually on that, isn't it? it yeah, uh, yeah, Yucca Mountain is sacred to the Shoshone and Paiute tribes and other tribes as well. And actually, by the Treaty of Ruby Valley, of 1863, a treaty of peace and friendship between the United States government and the Western Shoshone uh, nation. That is Western Shoshone land. They did not want the nuclear weapons test site on their land. They do not want the Yucca Mountain dump on their land. Yucca is sacred to them. They still use Yucca Mountain for uh, regular ceremonies. And uh, it's, it's uh, a top level environmental injustice that the uh, nuclear industry and their friends in government keep perpetrating on uh, Native American people. Kevin, what is in the nuclear waste? I mean, when, when we, we when we think here of uh, Vermont Yankee, we have the uh, spent fuel, uh, spent fuel rods, and and we call, we call it spent fuel that is above the ground and it's going to stay there. Could you tell us more about what the difference is? There a difference between spent fuel and nuclear waste? Well, um, the industry and its friends in government often use euphemisms to try to conceal and deceive the public about the dangers of their industry. So spent fuel is one of these euphemistic terms. Uh, what is spent in the nuclear fuel? Well, what is spent is the uh, 
uranium-235, the fissile material, has been consumed in the fission reaction to the point where it's no longer efficient to use that fuel anymore to make electricity. So they have to take it out, put it in the storage pool, and bring in fresh fuel, which has more uranium-235 that can sustain the chain reaction more efficiently. So I, I prefer to call it high-level radioactive waste, and it's... Uh, it's a million times more radioactive coming out of a reactor than when it went in. Uh, another deception the industry has used many times, in my experience, is to show workers, yes, they may be wearing their, their paper plasticized suit and perhaps even gloves working with nuclear fuel assemblies. Well, that is an unused, a fresh uh, nuclear fuel assembly because if it were used, which is another euphemism, they say used fuel, spent fuel, if they were that close to high-level radioactive waste with simply a paper suit on, they would be dead from gamma radiation exposure within seconds or minutes. And so that's why once uh, nuclear fuel comes out of an operating reactor core, it has to be moved underwater uh, into the pool. The water serves as radiation shielding for the workers who are still getting a gamma dose working around the open reactor or the storage pool for high-level radioactive waste. They're still getting a dose, but if that water were not there, they would get a fatal dose very quickly. And then eventually the waste will radioactively decay and thermally cool down in that storage pool. It's going to take five years for low burn-up fuel. For this new fuel of the past 15 years called high burn-up fuel, which is even more radioactive, it's going to take 10 years in the pool or longer, 15 years, before it's ready to come out and go into dry cask storage. Every one of these stages, when it comes out of the pool, it's got to be in a waste transfer cask, which has very thick walls. That is the radiation shielding. It goes into dry cask storage, which has very thick walls, which again is the radiation shielding. Every one of these stages, workers around it are still getting dosed with gamma radiation, but without that radiation shielding, they would get a fatal dose pretty much instantly. And so that's kind of the, the gamma hazard in the near term, and that gamma hazard is going to persist for centuries into the future. And then what's left after that, uh, things like plutonium-239, the stuff that's being sent to whip, mixed in with tools and clothes and whatever debris from the nuclear weapons complex, but these solid nuclear fuel rods from nuclear power plants they also contain uh, plutonium to the 1% level. That's 1% of the high-level radioactive waste is plutonium of five different isotopes. One of those isotopes is plutonium-239, which has this half-life of 24,000 years. So you got to multiply the half-life by 10 to 20 to get the hazardous persistence. So that's 240,000 years to 480,000 years of hazard. That's what repositories are going to have to hold without leaking. And we've seen at WIP, they've already had a leak just 15 years into this thing. And then there's other radioactive poisons in the waste. Iodine-129 is pretty inc incredible. A uh, half-life of 15.7 million years, so a hazardous persistence of 157 million to 314 million years. So high-level radioactive waste is our curse on all future generations. They're going to get to figure out how to keep this out of the environment. And what do you say now? How, how do we keep it out of the environment at this moment? You mentioned the, the dry casks. And do we have those at every nuclear power plant site? Yeah, well, the only real answer to high-level radioactive waste is to not make it in the first place. Um, that's why the news of Vermont Yankee shutdown by the end of this year is so tremendous. They won't make high-level radioactive waste anymore. The problem will be capped. It's a bad enough problem, believe you me. The reactor risks will go away instantly as soon as they shut it down permanently. But we have over 70,000 metric tons of high-level radioactive commercial waste in the United States. So what to do with it? Uh, the pools are full. By next year, uh, there's an NRC graphic that shows this. Every single pool in this country will be at top physical capacity. They do save a little bit of space in the pools for emergency offloads of operating mm -hmm. reactor cores, but they're up to that limit now. And so if they're going to put any more waste in the pools for storage, they're going to have to take older waste out. And we've seen dry cast storage in the U.S. since 1986, I believe, was the first one in Surrey, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Since that time, 
more and more and more power plants have run out of additional space in the pools, have put in dry cast storage as their overflow parking on site for high level radioactive waste. By next year, every plant in the country that's still operating will have dry cask storage. And so they just keep adding to the dry cask storage. What's really scandalous is they keep the pools as full as possible for as long into the future as possible to defer those costs of dry cask storage. Uh, you know, some tens of millions of dollars to build the dry cask storage facility, and every dry cask is another million or two million dollars to plunk out there on the back 40. They're trying to save that money by keeping the pools full, and the risk of that is if one of these pools were to suddenly drain down its cooling water, as by dropping one of these waste transfer casks that weigh close to 100 tons, punching a hole in the floor of the pool and draining all the water away, or a natural disaster, an earthquake draining the pool, the fire that would result uh, within just hours would, would make Fukushima look small. It would make Chernobyl look small. Because the pools are not located within radiological containment structures. At least reactors have containments. We've seen at Fukushima Daiichi that the containments are either severely damaged or completely destroyed around the reactors. But the claim by Tokyo Electric and the Japanese government, they're not very trustworthy sources, but they claim that the mother load of radioactivity is still in those damaged radiological containment structures. That what's gotten out has been kind of small in comparison to that. While the pools oftentimes will contain much more nuclear fuel than even an operating reactor core holds without the radiological containment structure around it. So they've saved a whole lot of money on doing it this way. But if a pool fire erupts, uh, it'll be an unprecedented radioactive disaster wherever that takes place. Kevin, when you say they've saved the money, uh, you're saying they, each individual nuclear power reactor uh, owner... And the, the nuclear and the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, has oversight over all of these, and they, they set the standards. Am I right on that? Yes, and you know, the payment at Vermont Yankee is uh, to Fukushima Daiichi. It's a General Electric boiling water reactor of Mark I containment design. So we've seen what that's capable of in terms of the reactor disasters at Fukushima, and. Fukushima is also the poster child for these pool risks because Unit 4, they are now getting the fuel out. They only just started last November because they had to rebuild the infrastructure on the Unit 4 reactor building. It was so close to collapse. So they were really and still are at great risk of a pool collapse at Unit 4 and one of these fires unfolding, which would dwarf what's happened already at Fukushima Daiichi. So it's been standard practice that the reactor containments are too small and too weak, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would say otherwise, but at least they, they saw the need to put these too small and too weak containments around the Mark I reactor cores. The pools, they never saw the need to put anything more than an industrial building around, and the Fukushima Daiichi Units 1, 2, I'm sorry, Units 1, 3, and 4 reactor buildings were destroyed by the explosions that took place there. So, um, there's not much to these reactor buildings. Uh, the pools were never required to be inside containment because it would have added a huge hefty price tag to the nuclear power plant. The assumption had always been that the waste would spend a minimum amount of time in the pool, five years, and then would be trucked off to a processing center at a place like West Valley, New York. Well, thank goodness reprocessing in West Valley only went on for six years because they made a $10 billion mess in that six-year time frame. There's a lot of problems with reprocessing. Mm -hmm. So instead of reprocessing, taking away the waste, or Yucca Mountain taking away the waste, the waste is simply piled up in the pools till they can't put any more in. And the default plan B at the reactor sites has been these uh, parking lot dumps at the reactor sites of dry casks, which are themselves very problematic. The whole techs that are in use and plan to use a whole lot more at Vermont Yankee are of questionable structural integrity sitting still. But they've even been licensed by the NRC as dual purpose, storage on site and transport to wherever they're going to. And how do we know this? Because a industry whistleblower from Exelon Nuclear in Chicago, Akshani, had the courage to take on not only Holtec International, and its subcontractors, but his own company, Exelon, 
which returned the favor of him doing his job and trying to protect the public health and safety by running him out of the company and then blacklisting him from the nuclear power industry for the rest of his life. That was Sharani's reward for doing his job. He was tasked with a quality assurance inspection on the Holtec dry casks in the year 2000. And he had such impeccable credentials that he was tapped to lead an industry-wide QA inspection with a dozen utilities inspectors under his supervision. And when they looked at the Holtec factory called U.S. Tool and Die in Pittsburgh, a subcontractor, they found nine major categories of quality assurance violation in a three-day time period. A very short time period, a snapshot of what was going on. They found inappropriate welding practices going on, welders who were not qualified. Uh, they were super cooling the weld by immersing the metal in uh, water, putting fans on the welds, introducing all kinds of brittleness into those welds. That's just one example. And the, the behavior was so brazen that Holtec and its subcontractor had prepared non-conformance reports in advance to the tune of hundreds. It was his comparison, Sharani's comparison was, if you know you're going to blow through a school zone going 100 miles an hour, and you have the check written to the cop when he pulls you over, that's kind of what was going on at U.S. Tool and Die. NRC has done nothing about this. In fact, they did a QA inspection of the same facility just before Sharani did, found no problems. So, you know, it's not just Sharani. There's a NRC whistleblower out of Region 3 Chicago, Dr. Ross Landsman, who fully backs up Sharani on these allegations. And NRC has never done anything about it. The, the whole techs are questionable in terms of safety. Mm -hmm. You you yourself have testified before the NRC. I'm, I'm thinking in particular of the San Onofre steam reactor, and you were asking them questions about the, uh, the safety of that. What was the outcome of, of, your, of your appearance before the NRC on that? Regarding San Onofre steam generators? Yes, yes. Yeah, I probably did take part in some public... Uh, proceeding or other, but, you know, the likes of Arnie Gunderson as expert witness for Friends of the Earth uh, made all the difference on shutting down two reactors in Southern California that the company, Southern California Edison, wanted to fire back up with severely defective replacement steam generators. They were going to operate at reduced power, 70% level, uh, a big nuclear experiment, and NRC seemed willing to go along for the ride. And it was not NRC that shut down San Onofre by requiring, you know, uh, upgrades to the safety situation. They were going to let them go forward. It was a licensing board that wanted to hear more from Friends of the Earth and Arnie Gunderson about their concerns about the safety. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, as it often does, was poised, if not acted, to override that licensing board. In fact, now that Southern California Edison just buckled under the pressure of Barbara Boxer breathing down their neck, uh, the groundswell of grassroots environmental activism out there, the company just threw in the towel. They thought they could get away with it. There was too bright a spotlight to get away with it. And so the NRC is even considering scrubbing the record that that licensing board had ever granted a hearing to um, hear more from Arnie Gunderson on the, on the safety risks. Mm -hmm. Incredible stuff. It's kind of like George Orwell, 1984, and um, the memory hole. No, that, that never happened. There was never a licensing board that wanted to hear about the dangers of the steam generators at San Onofre. We've actually retained Arnie Gunderson at the Davis-Bessey, Ohio, atomic reactor because they are undertaking the same kinds of shortcuts on safety as San Onofre did with its current steam generator replacement project. But we've been steamrolled this time by the licensing board. It's called the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, which is quite a misnomer. They have steamrolled us. Uh, if they had not steamrolled us, the NRC Commission was poised to simply overrule the licensing board. So they're going full steam ahead with the steam generator replacement at davis Bessey, despite Arnie Gunderson's warnings that the new uh, steam generators are very different than the old ones. That's the exact same thing that went down in San Onofre. And the new ones proved to be dangerously defective. So I guess we'll see how it goes um, on the Great Lakes shoreline in Ohio. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I know this was a little diversion from the our nuclear waste topic. 
here, but uh, now I have another question for you. Sure. What, okay. what have we learned from Fukushima regarding nuclear waste? Is there anything at all that we in the United States have learned that will make things a little bit better for us? Well, uh, one thing that folks like Bob Alvarez at Institute for Policy Studies and Japanese colleagues have pointed out is that the uh, dry casks at Fukushima Daiichi, and there were only eight, uh, survived uh, pretty well, the, uh, the earthquake and the tsunami. They, they were inundated, I believe, um, so they, they got flooded, uh, but they survived. And so we would hasten to point out that going from pool storage, you know, dense pool storage to dry cast storage is a safety upgrade, but it's not a good enough one for us. Uh, it's jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. And that's why the lesson that mo many of our watchdog groups learned long before Fukushima Daiichi was that the pools are very dangerous. Dry casks are still dangerous. And so what we called for beginning in 2002, and this is a phrase that Arjun Makajani at Institute for Energy and Environmental Research coined, is hardened on-site storage. This is a major safety upgrade to dry cast storage. It calls for emptying the pools. Most of the groups that have signed these principles for safeguarding nuclear waste at reactors uh, have called for is emptying the pools, shutting down the reactors, no more waste. For the waste that exists, yes, it will go into on-site storage. Yes, it will be dry cast storage, but it will be very different from what we have seen since 1986 with all these shortcuts on safety. One of the upgrades would have to be a security upgrade so that dry cask storage, hardened on-site storage, is actually designed to withstand terrorist attacks because it's not just those mobile Chernobyls moving through downtown Chicago. It's the dry casks, which are lined up like bowling pins out in the open air, out in plain sight, that are not designed to withstand an anti-tank missile at all. And something as simple as an earthen berm could prevent line-of-sight attacks with with certain missile systems. And under public pressure in Minnesota, back in the mid-1990s, Northern States Power, Excel Nuclear, buckled under the public pressure and did put up urban berms around their dry okay, cast storage. That's, so, that's a new uh, concept to me, an urban burn. No, earth, earth, made of earth, earthen. Earthen, it's simply okay. A, a wall of dirt, you right. know, and all it takes is a bobcat. My joke is, you know, I've got an uncle in Michigan who could probably do it for a few thousand bucks if they wanted to hire him. It's an eight foot tall or taller uh, wall of earth uh, to prevent these tow anti-tank missiles from being fired directly at dry casks. Uh, we're making the job of terrorists very simple at nuclear power plants these days. And, you know, the 911 commission report documented that Mohammed Atta, the lead attacker who flew the f first plane into the World Trade Center, had wanted to attack Indian Point never got permission from the higher-ups in Al-Qaeda. Before Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was captured, and he's still in Guantanamo Bay as we speak, and he was waterboarded to get information out of him, before he was captured, he gave an interview to an Al Jazeera reporter, and it saw the light of day in a Spanish newspaper. He was in Pakistan hiding. And he said the original plan was for 10 hijacked air airplanes, two of which were going to fly into nuclear facilities, but we scaled back our plans, and... Uh, the interviewer asked him, so have you ruled out future attacks on nuclear power plants? And he said, no, we've not ruled them out. But on 9-11, we did not want things to get out of hand. That was a quote. We did not want things to get out of hand. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a sense, we're relying on the moral restraint of Al-Qaeda in terms of nuclear security in this country. The, the densely packed pools at Indian Point, for example, which Atta wanted to attack, uh, Ed Lyman at Union of Concerned Scientists has done a study dated 2004 before Fukushima. It was titled Chernobyl on the Hudson? Question mark. It was about a terrorist attack at Indian Point. The, the dollar figure for property values in terms of property damages was in the trillions of dollars that could happen if there were a successful terrorist attack. Trillions of dollars of property damage. And the, uh, the casualties were like 44,000 radiation poisoning deaths, I remember that one, uh, over 500,000 latent cancer fatalities. So these are the risks, uh, not only from reactor meltdowns, but from radioactive waste disasters. And again, you mentioned lessons from Fukushima. Unit 3, according to Arnie Gunderson's latest information, 
is probably worse than Unit 4 in terms of the storage pool at Fukushima Daiichi. That's very bad news. There are 50 tons of debris from the largest of the explosions at Fukushima Daiichi that fell back into the Unit 3 storage pool. What shape that irradiated nuclear fuel is in, we don't know. Unit 4, they're slowly getting the least damaged fuel out first. They're going to run into more and more damaged fuel. We're not out of the woods yet in terms of the storage pools at Fukushima Daiichi after Mm -hmm. three years. After three, yes, exactly. March 11th. Right this week. Kevin, this is all startling and disturbing information. Now, when you talk about the hardened on site storage, you're, you use the future tense and you say would and will. Do we have hardened on site storage? Uh, there are small examples. I mentioned uh, Minnesota. Um, another place where they put up the, the wall of earth was uh, Palo Verde, Arizona. So um, these are voluntary actions by the utilities. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not requiring it. Neither is Homeland Security, nor the Department of Energy, nor Congress, nor the White House. Our calls for hardened on-site storage have been going on for 12 years now. And we've worked very hard. I mean, we had a Capitol Hill lobby day um, in about 2005 that was led by um, Citizens Awareness Network of the Northeast. Uh, It was long before Fukushima. But it was the security risks to the Mark I pools that were um, the priority there. And so time and time again, this information has been brought to the decision makers. And uh, it's all about saving the industry money. That's the top priority of of all of these government agencies and even the U.S. Congress, as far as I can tell, judging by their behavior. I believe the first time I met you, Kevin, uh, it was at the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability lobbying days, DC days, and you have that coming up again in May. Could you tell us something about that? And, and we're going to have to wind down now, and I want to invite sure. you back again when you can come back to, to further educate us on, on this this big, big problem that we have and this sleeping problem that our uh, viewers and myself, we, we prefer to not think about it, Kevin. You know, yeah, we, I'd love we, to come back. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. And well, if folks can make it down for um, the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability's uh, annual DC days, it's a great event. You have hundreds of people coming in from all over the country. Most of ANA is uh, three dozen groups who watchdog the DOE nuclear weapons complex. And given the WIP uh, contamination uh, accident that just took place, that's going to be high on the priority list. But uh, nuclear power is another important issue that's addressed during this this annual education day for Capitol Hill. And also the federal agencies. Uh, We we go to Capitol Hill, we go to the federal agencies, and we present our side of things. trying to counter the nuclear lobbyists who just own the place. Right. The nuclear lobbyists are going up and down the corridors of power every working day. Every day. Yeah. And spending uh, an old figure, so it's worse now, $1.25 million per week on nuclear power lobbying. That was the rate from 1999 to 2009. So it's worse now since they've had five more years to hone their techniques and lavish more money on elected officials. Kevin, thank you so much for being my guest here today on Nuclear Free Future, and I look forward to your return, and um, and it, it has been both a a sorrow and a pleasure to hear all of, uh, all of what you had to say. The pleasure is that you are there every day as the nuclear watchdog. And well... Congratulations to the people of Vermont on the shutdown of Vermont Yankee. It's a tremendous grassroots victory. Hugely inspiring. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. Goodbye till next time. Thank you, viewers. Thank you. Goodbye.